My name is Roger Royce. I'm a partner with the law firm of Haynes and Boone. I'm resident in the Palo Alto office in Silicon Valley. I work with technology startups, emerging growth and venture capital. I've formed companies, I do financings, handle commercial contracts and M&A. Also do fund formation in my office from time to time. Uh, Haynes and Boone is a full service international firm, so we do everything. Uh, startup related and then even beyond. We can grow with our companies as they get bigger. Um, in particular, I'm um, pretty active in, in a handful of verticals, more so than others, uh, fintech, health tech, and most of all, agritech. That's the technology of food production. Um, I, do, I have a lot of clients in that space. I know that vertical extremely well. And in terms of the technologies that we work with, it's pretty much industry agnostic, but we see pretty much everything. Our, our firm has an autonomous vehicle group, a precision medicine group. I do a lot with AR, uh, uh, a AR augmented reality, virtual reality, um, and uh, pretty much everything that, that you might have seen has probably come through my office. I've been doing this for 35 years. I've probably counseled 10,000 startups. So with that, uh, welcome back. I'm going to leave you my information in the chat. If you have questions for me while I talk, go ahead and put it in the chat and uh, we'll, we'll take your questions at the end. And, uh, and if you get a chance, chat me where you're from as well. I'd like to know who, who my audience is and who I'm talking to. All right, for starters, I'm going to share my screen. And um, all right. So you should see a, um, hi from Palo Alto, okay, good. Uh, you should see my, uh, my uh, title slide. Uh, if you don't chat me, if you do chat me, uh, let me know if it's working. And um, <clears throat> first of all, uh, I am, uh, one of my personality defects is that I'm a lawyer. So I will be talking about some law from time to time. Uh, but keep in mind, I'm not your lawyer, not yet. This is just general advice, not specific legal advice. You need to hire me to get specific legal advice. Today, we're talking about funding primarily, at least that'll be the first topic. And I'm going to go through this really quickly and really high level. If you want to find out more about any of these topics, I have hundreds of hours of material and slides and video on my YouTube site, Roger Royce Law. Uh, if you text me, email me, or link with me, I can send you the links, and you'll also find it in the chat. Wow, Switzerland, that's great. Okay, sources of funding. Where does money come from for a startup? Um, these are what we're going to talk about. Founders, of course. Um, savings. I, so here's my rule about founders funding. Um, I think a founder has to have a little bit of money in, in the game. I'll talk about that more later. Uh, a little bit of money. <clears throat> Founders should not do something crazy. <laughs> they should not have so much money in the company that the investors are worried that they might not act rationally. So my rule of thumb is, and I've heard other lawyers say different things that I tell people, do not mortgage your house to fund this company. You know, if you've got some savings, if you've got some extra cash, uh, you, can, uh, you can use a credit card. You might take money out of an IRA, not out of a 401k. Uh, there's a difference in my mind. Uh, but you need to have enough skin in the game to show the investors you're serious, but not so much, like I say, to show them that you, you, know, you, you might not act rationally. Debt financing for a startup, not so much. We'll talk about why that is. Government grants, uh, not historically been a big fan because there's so much effort that goes into getting them, but there are government grants. Uh, friends and family, um, angels, seed investors, institutional VC, or private equity. And then what I will call alternative financing, although it's getting to be a lot less of an alternative these days and more mainstream, rewards-based crowdfunding, Jobs Act crowd financing or equity, uh, initial coin offerings, STOs, IEOs, NFTs now, and royalty financing. So before we jump into some of these specifics, uh, I'd like to, you to keep a few basic principles in mind if you're going out to raise money. And these are just some things, no matter who you're talking to or what, what route or what avenue you're going to pursue, I think it's important to keep these principles in mind. Number one, you have to view your equity investors as partners. 
think of it as a marriage with no divorce, okay? Uh, so the corollary, of course, is choose your partners very carefully because you are going to be with them for a long time, probably the life of your company. So you want to choose your partners carefully. Uh, that's number one. Investors are partners, and that's the charitable way of saying it. Uh, as a lawyer, uh, if they're a bad investor or a bad partner, we sometimes say investors are potential plaintiffs, and that's the last thing you want. Number two, stage your financing. Okay, I hear companies from time to time, they always aim too high. Um, they, they want to raise more money than they should. You should stage your financing, take it in increments, close the round, then do the next round at a higher valuation. Close the round, do the next round at a higher valuation. You get way more bang for your buck that way. Uh, don't get the idea that you're just going to go out and raise $50 million and be done with it. That's, it's, first of all, it's not likely to happen. I guess these days with a SPAC, it probably could, but it's going, you're going to give up way more of the company than you probably want to. Number three, get used to the fact that you're going to get diluted, okay? Unless it's debt funding or um, uh, what we call non-dilutive financing, uh, like a token offering, uh, most funding is dilutive. That means your percentage of that pie is going to get smaller as the pie gets bigger. You know, get used to that, uh, understand that, uh, you know, get it into your head that you are, when you take outside money, you are giving up part of your equity. And that's why equity investment is so expensive. Here's a good one. Uh, another, another psychological thing. Don't get your ego involved in your valuation, okay? Your valuation might not have much at all to do with what you're worth or what your company's worth. Certainly not what you're worth personally. Your valuation a lot of times is just math, right? It's just how big can we scale this company and what per, what does the investor need to get out of it? You know, and if you do the math, that comes up with your valuation. In other words, if the investor needs 20% and you need a million dollars, your valuation is $5 million, right? It's just math. Sometimes it's that rudimentary, you know, it's that unsophisticated. Um, because as a startup, it's almost impossible to figure a real valuation. So I wouldn't get hung up on these numbers. Plus, early valuation doesn't mean much. It's something that is going to be adjusted over and over again throughout the life of the company. It's kind of like last time, if you were here, we talked about early uh, equity ownership might not mean that much because it's going to get adjusted throughout the life of the company. Um, <clears throat> valuation is not your biggest issue. Um, it is a big issue, not your biggest usually. Who your partner is, who your investor is, your biggest issue, what they bring to the table. Um, secondly, all the other economic and control rights that they're asking for might be your biggest issue. We'll talk more about that. Avoid early mistakes. What do I mean by that? There is sort of an attitude that if you're early stage, you don't really, you can be, you can be a lot sloppier, and you can go online and download forms and not really understand what they mean and uh, sell stock to anybody and just the idea is gee we're just going to fix this later with respect to that go look at principle number one your investors are partners you might not be able to fix it later and i have seen really good companies uh, die in litigation when they tried to do their real round because of the friends and family the way they brought the friends and family into the early round for example um, you're better off incorporating in Delaware. It's really hard to do that once you get 100 shareholders. Not impossible, it's just hard to do that. Um, there's little things like that. Um, for example, complying with the securities laws, right? It's uh, relatively easy to do, but it can be really punitive if you haven't done that. Now, again, I can fix that, but it's expensive. Take cheap money over expensive money. You should always be doing pro formas and figuring out what the money is really costing you. Debt is other than you know non-dilutive financing. Revenue is the cheapest money, right? Uh, token offerings are probably cheap, but debt um, is a lot cheaper than equity typically. And if you're a candidate for debt, you would take it as long as you don't have to guarantee it. We'll talk more about that. Here's a good one. 
Common stock is for service providers, all right? Common stock is not for investors. Let's keep that in mind. I know there's another temptation to just save a lot of money on fees and expense and sell common, but you wanna keep your common stock price low. And that's why we sell preferred in a high stock, high price. Why do we keep our common stock price low? Because we're gonna be giving that out in the form of options. And the lower the common stock price, the more attractive your options. Get a data room, okay? Here's a good tip for you, a good practice pointer for you. You know, you'll be well served if you get a data room early on in your company's life where you can save documents in the cloud so they don't get lost. I don't know if I've ever worked with a company that didn't lose stuff. You know, it just happens. You know, lawyers lose stuff, clients lose stuff. It just, signature pages get lost. Just load all that stuff into your data room. You don't have to worry about it. Um, my firm, we uh, have the capacity to set up an account, a data account, of basically a box room for every new startup that we form. The other reason you do that is it, it's when you do get into do a financing with an institutional investor or even some smart angels, they will do due diligence. They'll want to see your documents. If you can just point them to a data room that's already been populated, uh, you'll save yourself a lot of time and you'll make your lawyer's life easier too. And finally, do the cleanup ahead of time. Don't wait for an investor to tell you that you might have made one of these mistakes. Do it before you talk to the investor. Mistakes are free before you talk to an investor. Mistakes cost you valuation points or maybe the whole deal if uh, you wait until somebody points it out. Like I said, uh, most companies will rely on personal savings of their founders or um, maybe their founder's parents uh, for their initial funds. Nothing wrong with that, as long as it's not too much. But then you're going to go to the next tier, and that's what we want to talk about here. So how much money should you expect to be taking from folks? Uh, angels, friends and family, angel groups, VCs. So this data might be a little dated, but um, as of uh, last time I checked, angels were investing on average around 25,000. It's probably closer to 50 now. Um, and of course, that varies all over the place. Here in Silicon Valley, the numbers tend to be bigger all the time. So you, you see angels and regularly doing million dollar investments. Angel groups, what is that? That's uh, a, a group of angels that uh, will all look at your company at the same time and then independently make a decision. 250 to 750,000. Early stage venture capitalists, my rule of thumb is, we'll, you know, once you're at uh, one and a half million dollars, we'll do, we'll consider a priced round. That means you're going to sell stock and not some sort of convertible, uh, but typically three to five million. Then later stage VCs, $10 million and up. Now, when you do get into a financing, you're going to be dealing with a lead, all right? There's going to be some champion for you, some hero, some, you know, some first investor uh, that is going to lead the way, and the other investors are going to follow that lead. You're not going to negotiate with all 10 of your investors in your round. You're going to negotiate with the lead, and everybody else will just piggyback on what they get. So here's the thing to know about, the, and this, it's true for angels, it's true for angel funds, it's true for VCs. Here's what you should know about the lead. Uh, your lead investor, first of all, ideally, this is your perfect lead investor, should be smart money. Hey, what do I mean by smart money? It's somebody who really understands your business and your company and what you're doing. Um, you always would rather have smart money as opposed to dumb money. Uh, which is the opposite of smart money. It means it's somebody, it's not necessarily that they're dumb, it's that they're not really paying attention. But you want your lead to be smart, to know what they're getting into. Secondly, chemistry, what I mean by that, it ought to be someone that you can get along with because you are going to be with this investor for a long time. They're your partner. So make sure that you find somebody that you're going to be comfortable with and you can talk to and you can communicate with or the term of your investment and the term of your company in effect. Commitment, you want somebody who's going to be committed to the company, um, for sure. You, uh, you know, that kind of goes without saying probably. Um, deep pockets, hopefully it's somebody that can do follow on rounds that has enough money to uh, continue to fund a company down the road. 
And really importantly, it should be somebody that has a big network, okay? A really big network so they can bring other people into your round. Okay, other types of finance. Let's get into the specific types of financing. Bank debt, very few of my startups, certainly none of my early stage startups are candidates for bank debt. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Um, if you are a candidate for bank debt, what that means is that you've got free cash flow. And if you've got cash flow, you're probably not a venture fundable sort of company uh, because venture capitalists, they don't want you hoarding cash. Uh, cash is, um, they, there's things they like better than cash. Uh, they like user base better than cash. They want you to be building um uh, building out the goodwill of the business so you can have a big splashy exit down the road. So it's not many of the startups I work with who are almost always going towards venture capital that um, that would qualify for debt financing. However, not everybody has to get venture capital financing. Um, I oftentimes say it's funding of last resort for most companies because they can get it from someplace else. So what I would do is if you are a kind of company that has cash flow, then yes, debt is going to be cheap. Debt is what you should get. Equity is not what you should sell. However, be careful of two things. Number one, a lender is going to want security. That's okay. If it's a secure, if it's a, by security, those are assets that secure the debt. They have liens against your assets. And that's just like when you do buy a house, you have to give a mortgage on your house. And that's okay as long as the security belongs to the company and it isn't the mortgage on your house or your personal assets. And that's closely related to the second thing. For small companies, almost always lenders want personal guarantees. Be super careful about personal guarantees. Um, I've seen so many people get into trouble over personal guarantees. And you need to consider that most businesses in this country fail, right? Most businesses fail, especially in this country because it's there's really no way to get bailed out typically uh, if something goes wrong. The 2020 is the exception that proves that rule. But most, think about that, most companies fail and that's okay. You can live to fight again, but you want to be able to live to fight again. You might not if you've signed a personal guarantee, you have something that follows you for the rest of your life. I have seen that happen more than once. It is not pretty at all. Government grants and loans. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on this. So, you know, just point out there's some website if you want to take a look at what's available. The SBIR program, I've been seeing that more and more lately. Uh, I think the government gave out $40, million, $40 billion. And, and this is for uh, technology that you're developing that could be used for R&D uh, for uh, the federal government. And then grants through uh, STTR, another federal technology program. Uh, that could be a whole hour on its own. Friends and family, most companies are going to, well, a large percentage of the founders are going to get money from friends and family. It's usually a small amount per person. This is the easiest money. These are people who are betting on your PowerPoint. They're not going to going to do any diligence. Uh, they're not going to push you on any of your assumptions. They're just going to give you money on a flyer and Hopefully, and that's okay, you can take friends and family money. As we talked about last during the last session, I really don't think you should take money from unaccredited investors, even if they're your friends and even if they're your family. It's not because I'm worried about them, because I'm worried how it's going to affect your later financings down the road. So unless you absolutely have to, I tell companies don't do it, don't take it. What's an accredited investor? That is somebody who meets either an ownership or a, um, a net worth requirement. I'm sorry, an income or a net worth requirement. The income is $200,000 a year for the current year and the prior two years, or $300,000 jointly with the spouse. And the net worth requirement is $1 million net worth, excluding personal residence. I really don't think, even with your friends and family, you, you can, legally, you can take money from unaccredited, uh, provided that it's a low enough number. But um, again, it will cause you problems down the road sometimes. All right. Um, yeah, put your questions in the chat. I'm going to get to them at the end in, uh, in about 15, 20 minutes here. 
outside money, because I, I do want to get through a, a couple of things before we get into specifics. Um, angels, venture capitalists, crowdfunding, private equity, et cetera. So once you decide you're ready to go talk about outside money, let me drill down a little bit on some of my principles. But the first question is going to be, how much are you going to raise? So here's the most common way of making that determination. Um, you raise enough to get you to the next valuation milestone or metric, right? You raise enough to get you to the next milestone. That's how much you want to raise. Now you can express that in terms of burn rate, right? Oh, gee, I burn $100,000 a month and it's going to take me 10 months, you know, to get my product in my FDA approval or get my product released. Okay, so you need a million dollars, right? And once I get the product released, I'll have a higher valuation. All right, we also relate it to that is the idea of a target runway. I need a year's worth of runway, right? That's a million dollars. And then, as I said before, a lot of times from the investor standpoint, um, they're making their calculation based on what percentage they need and how much money you need. So if you tell them that, gee, you need a million dollars, like I say, to get to the next valuation um, valuation point, um, and they're thinking, well, I need 20% or it's not worth it to me, there's your valuation. Oof, it's just math. Um, on that point, let me pause for a minute. How, you know, like I say, enough to get to the valuation event. Usually we want that valuation event to be two times what your current value is. We'll live with one and a half, but we'd like it to be two times and we'd like it to be one to two years down the road. So that's ideal, you know, because if it's any sooner than that, you're spending all your time fundraising and not doing work for the company. And if your valuation is any less than that, I don't know if you're doing another round, maybe you're just doing a series, a subseries of an existing round. You'd like your round to be up. Like I said, you want it to be two times, but you want to be careful about that too. Um, I've worked with companies where they were really good about, you know, getting a high valuation in the next round. And then they come to realize that, you know what, that was too high a number. Now our next round's got to be a down round. The investors aren't happy about it. Um, doesn't make the company look good. It seems like something's wrong. Obviously they missed something. They missed some you know, they didn't get the contract they thought they were going to get, whatever it is. So you really would like to avoid down rounds. And plus, I can show you mathematically how it hurts a founder because of the anti-dilution adjustments more to do an up round than a down round than to just do, you know, a slightly up round and another slightly up round, if that makes any sense. All right, when you go out to talk to investors, there's two really important documents, one of which is the executive summary. And this is a one page document, maybe two pages, and it's just the facts, right? Short description of the company's mission. Uh, the rest of this has to be very factual and very direct. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to give the investor a snapshot so they know at a glance if you're for them or not. If, if, remember, if, if, if you're in a space they want to invest in, if um, you're in a stage they want to invest in, if there's, you know, whatever it is that they look for, you want them to be able to see that at a glance. If they like your executive summary, which has all these things, and by the way, if anybody wants a template for an executive summary, just email me, I've got one I can share with you. Then we go on to a pitch deck. And I'm sure that you probably have plenty of hours of instruction on how to do a pitch deck. Um, I'm just gonna add two things to that that you might not have heard um, from anybody else. Number one is don't make it too long. Don't make it too long. Uh, investors will resent you if your pitch deck is way too long. It's not supposed to be a motion picture, a full length motion picture. It's supposed to be sort of to the point with lots of places for the investor to ask questions. And secondly, don't mention your valuation. Okay, don't mention your valuation in your pitch deck because whatever number you put in your pitch deck is going to get chopped by the VC. So, and, and that's one reason. The second reason is that it does not make you look, um, what's the word? It does not make you look very savvy if you do that. You know, you're, it's going to reflect negatively on you. So, I know other people will tell you different things, but my experience is you should not be talking valuation in a pitch deck. Um, now, once in a while, somebody is going to want you to tell them what the value of your company is. Um, certainly, that happens at angel stage a lot, 
right? If I'll say I want to buy a convertible instrument with a valuation cap. That's not your valuation. That's just a cap. So I'm not talking about that. But when you go do an equity investment, uh, when you finally get to that stage, usually the investor is going to give you a term sheet. And that term sheet is going to have a valuation. It's one of the first things it's going to tell you. Once in a while, they'll come to you and they'll say, you know, um, what's your valuation? You want to offer it up unless they ask you. And just as a negotiation matter, I don't think you want to offer it up anyway. Uh, but if you're forced, then what are you going to do? You have to come up with a number. So I have identified about 30 different ways that I've seen uh, companies come up with values. And if anybody would like, I have a memo describing all of these in greater detail. If you email me, I'll send it to you. But what I try to do, if you're in that uncomfortable situation, is find three of these methods that converge on a number, right? And some of them are really kind of simple and unsophisticated. Um, uh, here, let's find one. Patents plus people times a million dollars. Other that are very sophisticated, discounted cash flow or discount to public company valuations. So, but you find three that come up, converge on a number, you put it in an Excel spreadsheet and you say, this is why we think we're worth what we're worth. Hopefully you're not in that position, but if you are, make sure you can back up and justify your numbers. Okay, um, a couple other ways to raise money, rewards-based crowdfunding. All I will say about this, you all have heard about it, it's been around forever, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, et cetera, is if you're going to do a crowdfunding, make sure it succeeds, right? You don't want it to fail. The way that crowdfunding works is that uh, you typically, you have to raise a certain amount of money. And if you don't raise that money, you got to give what you have raised back. And it's rewards-based. So sometimes they'll get a product, usually they'll get a baseball cap or a t-shirt or something. But the reason you do it is to show the world that people love your company and love your product so much, they will give you money without even asking for anything. Uh, the flip side of that is that if you go out and the funding fails, this is all public knowledge. It's out there for all to see. If it fails and you've told the world people don't really care much about your product. So you got to be super careful and hardwire your crowd financing, crowdfunding to actually succeed. Now, that's way different than equity-based crowdfunding or crowd financing. Uh, as of last month, we can now sell uh, any company. It's a U.S. company, unfortunately can now sell up to $5 million of securities in a 12 month period under an equity crowdfunding, uh, Reg CF. That means you can raise from unaccredited investors. They put it on a platform. These are people that invest small amounts of money that are out there in the internet, in the ethernet or their ether, I should say. And they, they can come onto the platform. Here are three big ones I work with frequently. WeFunder, Republic, Start Engine, and, and companies sell securities. Uh, in 2012, when we first had a crowdfunding law, when this first was enacted, everybody thought this would be a disaster. It turned out to actually be a very good thing. Lots and lots of money is being raised through equity crowdfunding, something every company ought to consider if you're the kind of company that can form an affinity with your investors. So for example, if you have a product people totally get, like a B to C product, like one of the most successful uh, early uh, crowdfunding campaigns was uh, a little really thin watch, right? Well, people get that, you know what a watch is. So that was a good successful crowdfunding. On the other hand, if you've got some really complex biotech thing that nobody can understand unless you're, unless you've got a PhD, you might have trouble selling that in a crowdfinancing. So <clears throat> keep in mind, uh, and same thing with, with rewards-based. You definitely want your crowdfunding to succeed. I've had companies raise money crowdfunding that they did not need to hassle or the cost. They only did it to show the world that people are dying to get into their company and it worked. Then there's this thing called accredited only crowdfunding. That's the kind of offerings you see on AngelList, Seed Invest, Funders Club, Circle Up, Our Crowd uh, from Israel. So, the thing about accredited only crowdfunding is that, like it says, you only take money from accredited investors, but you can take way more. There's no $5 million limit. The sky's the limit. Um, but the investors, either they have you have to reasonably, reasonably believe that they're accredited, uh, if you, but then you can't advertise, or you can advertise and generally solicit, 
provided that they actually are accredited investors and you verify that status. Uh, these days, verification is not difficult at all. There are services that will do this dirt cheap. So it's a really good way to go out and get money from accredited only investors. And you want accredited investors. Those are the ones that are not going to cause you securities law problems. So accredited only crowdfunding, I think is way better than any of these others. Again, here are several of the crowdfunding sites that I've worked with over the years. Reg A plus, briefly, it's, uh, you can raise up to $75 million. It's like a mini public offering. It's expensive, it's a little later on. It's probably not for you right now, but keep in mind that once you get down to that later financing, there's a way to go out and raise money from a public market without having to do a full blown IPO. And finally, we could talk for hours about initial coin offerings that were all the rage in 2017, 2018. They're still happening, they're still out there, just not so much in the United States. Uh, our Securities and Exchange Commission uh, views these as securities in almost every case and has been relatively hostile uh, to the whole industry, despite what they might say. By the way, Gary Gensler was just sworn in as the new chairman of the SEC last week. It was this, it was this week, yeah, this week. And he teaches this at MIT, but he believes this is an area that deserves heavy regulation. So we don't just, we, the only time we see ICOs in the United States now is if you can go immediately to an SEC registered exchange, um, which is a great way to, to raise money because the exchange has already vetted all of your investors. They've done the KYC, the AML, they've made sure they're accredited, um, but it limits the pool of money you can get. So usually these happen offshore. Royalty financing, this is something you're going to hear about more and more. It's, it's, there's a lot of regulatory uncertainty and a lot of tax uncertainty, but I've been doing this more and more. And this is the idea that rather than getting loans or selling stock, you give somebody a percentage of a revenue stream. Look, I'll give you give me a million dollars, I'll give you 10% of the revenue from the sale of this product for the next 10 years or something like that. Uh, we see more and more like that. The venture capitalists will view this like debt, just so you know. And that means it's more debt on the company's balance sheet, lowers the valuation because it gets paid before they do. But it is out there. And, um, and I've heard a lot of very credible people touting this as not only an alternative to loans and equity, but an alternative to venture capital. Okay, angels. That's a snow angel, by the way, in case we were wondering. Is anybody from a cold country? Person from Switzerland has probably seen one of these. So angels are high net worth individuals um, who um, invest in startup companies, angel groups, or as you might guess, just groups of these individuals. You'll probably pitch to them all at the same time and each of them decide what they want to do. Angel funds is when these high net worth individuals, they pool their money. I'm gonna go fast because I want to get to venture. So there are good angels, bad angels, and ugly angels. Just keep that in mind. The good angels are going to give you connections to venture capital funding. Those are great angels. You want those angels. The good angels are smart and they're going to give you advice and mentorship. And the good angels are going to have some money and not whine about it if it, things don't go the way they want it to because they're professionals and they understand this and they do this all the time. Uh, the bad angels are probably a little less sophisticated. Uh, once you take their money, they take you hostage, right? They're always pestering you. They want to have five board meetings a month. <laughs> they want uh, lots and lots of reports and information. They're going to bug you about your numbers, especially if you don't hit them. They're going to whine and complain if you don't, and they're going to demand. Those are not good angels. Angels just have to understand they need to let you go off and do your job. And the worst angels are the ones that sue companies. Yes, they do. I've seen more than one angel. They put a little bit of money into a company and they end up owning the company. That happens. It happens more often than you might think. That's why you want to do background checks uh, on anybody you do business with and see if they've done that before. Because if they have, you might not want them around. Or another version of, of the ugly angel uh, is the one that, that acts against your company's interest because now they've got access to your confidential information and they use it in ways 
that might not make sense to you, but might to them. Maybe they want to take you out of the market. Um, maybe they want to keep your valuation low so they can put more money in. I have seen this happen where the angel goes to the next round investor and talks them out of investing so they can get the round instead at a lower value. So stay away from unethical people. And it's the moral of that story. I'm going to jump ahead um, over some of these specifics. Um, you know, what I really want to do is talk about venture capital with the few minutes that we've got. Obviously, uh, I've got a lot to say here um, because eventually that's where this is a venture capitalist, by the way, in case you've never seen one. And, you know, that's where most tech startups are heading. They want to get venture capital. By the way, that's a joke. Some of my best friends are venture capitalists. But venture capital money is, is, is high. It's $130 billion last year, all-time high, historical record. There's lots of money in the system here in venture capital. Um, this is from Crunchbase just last month. Q1 was uh, a record again. Uh, here's, here's some uh, global numbers, uh, is what things look like. You can see that there's a lot of venture capital, including seed venture private equity, going into the ecosystem. Uh, let me give you another one, by month. So here I've got February. I know I've got more recent numbers, but it stayed strong. Q1 has been incredibly strong for venture capital. Here we go. Look at this. This is North American venture, venture dollar volume. Um, you can see that um, overall dollar volume is, is just really, really high, uh, especially, look at there, early, late stage has gotten the most money, but early stage is still very healthy, okay? Angel stage is very, um, uh, angel stage has been very consistent. Uh, that's North America. Anyway. So venture capital, I've only got a few minutes here before we open it up to questions. So should you take venture capital? Well, keep in mind, you know, you have to give up equity. That's a drag, that's really expensive. So just keep that in mind. Um, you would only do that if you don't have cash flow to service debt, because it is so expensive. Uh, it's a risky investment. So you, you know, if you're the kind of company that's pretty high return, but high risk, you might be a candidate for venture capital. It's still liquid. You're looking for investors who are going to buy stock they can't sell. Um, and this is really important. Your business has to be scalable, right? It has to be scalable. That means it can grow really, really large. Um, and it has to do it really quickly. If we call that explosive growth. It has to be able to grow really large, really fast. And by really large, that's the third point. It's got to be a huge market. Now, that market doesn't have to exist today. But so I should say huge potential market, but you have to be able to describe the fact that it is a huge market. Think of self-driving cars, right? You know, when, when those companies first started getting funded, weren't really any on the road, there still aren't. Uh, but we can see, even though that's not a market that exists today, it is a huge potential market. Um, just a couple things about venture economics. I'm not going to go through all of this. Suffice it to say, that the VC fund wants has to make a lot of money. If you're dealing with VCs, it has to. They're looking for home runs. They're not looking for a 12% return. Uh, just because of the way VC funds are put together, they have to earn a lot of money on your investment. And here's a good. This is a good slide. VCs they expect when they invest that half their companies are going to lose money. They expect that 20 or 30% are going to be just return what they invested or maybe a little bit more than that. So what they're really looking for is the home run. So imagine you're a venture capitalist and you have a hundred million dollar fund and you put $10 million into a company that becomes the next um, Coinbase, right? And you got in at a low valuation and you made a hundred times your money. So how much do you need to make in all the other companies uh, in order to have a successful fund? And the answer is it doesn't matter because you've hit your home run, you're done. You know, that's what they're looking for. You know, they're looking for as many of those home runs as they can get. So they're looking for high risk, but super high return. Once you know that, you'll know how to position yourself for a VC. Again, we talked about the potential market. Why you, you know, why now? Why do you need their expensive money? Because you need to be first to market. And we're looking at long-term scale, not short-term profits. 
um, and traction. This is a word you're gonna hear a lot, traction. What does traction mean? Typically means revenue, but not quite. It means that you can prove that somebody will buy your product. That's what VCs wanna know. Not that you've given it away, you know, and people will use it if you give it to them for free, but that people will pay you for it. That's traction, that's really important. Um, you know, I'm not going to get into the specific terms unless people ask me to, but um, uh, I will tell you that when you do deal, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do two more slides and go to questions. So number one, venture capital, they're looking for really three things, uh, a really good team, okay? Because when you talk to a VC, what they're thinking is that if you sold them on the idea and the business plan and the industry and the future and the product and the technology, what they're thinking is, are these the right people to turn this into something? Or should I bet on someone else to take the same idea? Because somebody else is out there with a, if not the same idea, at least an alternative, okay? You might say you have no competitors. Would you agree you have alternatives? All right, can somebody else better, somebody else better suit it for that alternative. So what's gonna make your team the winning team? Number one, domain expertise. If you have someone on your team that understands that industry, that's gold, you really need that. If you're doing FinTech, have somebody who understands financial services. And secondly, technical co-founders, right? Most companies I work with are technology companies. They need a co-founder that can do the technology. Right? They need a co-founder that understands technical so you don't have to use the VC's money to go hire people to build it. And by the way, it's never gonna work because when you hire people to build it, they're just not as committed as a co-founder is to actually solving a problem and getting it done. That's team. Secondly, your technology or product. Two things, again, number one, you should sell, solve problems and address pain points. You want to sell aspirin, not vitamin pills. Things that people need, not things that people know they should have, but probably will never get around to. Secondly, and this is that traction idea, customer validation. You need to show that people will pay for this product. That's what you want to show them. And then finally, market, let's call this market fit rather than market size. We want it to be a huge market, but we also want to know that you fit that market and can get into it and can turn this into huge revenue. All right, last slide. When you pick a VC, I told you what they're looking at when they pick you. When you pick a VC, uh, number one, reputation, right? Reputation, number one, go on Google, see what you can read about them. Are they, um, do people say good things about them? Do they have a lot of successes? Do they have a lot of wins? Are they the kind of VC that signs, if they sign a term sheet, they're gonna close that term sheet. They're not just gonna leave you hanging out there while they sign six other term sheets. So reputation is important. And by the way, reputation all, all also means uh, if they can keep you moving on down the line. Do they have relationships with investment bankers or other larger funding vehicles or even other VCs? Likelihood of closing we talked about. Then stage of the fund, right? Most funds last seven to 10 years, usually on the 10 year side these days. Um, and are they towards the end of the life of their fund? Uh, because if so, they might not be around to do a follow-on investment. You just ought to know that. I'm not saying it's a deal breaker. You just ought to know that, if, you know, where they are in the fund. So you know how long they're going to be invested in you, not only to do the follow-on, but also how long is it going to be before they start pestering you to sell the company so they can exit the fund. Um, and I've seen companies get forced to sell before they wanted to because the VC fund is coming to an end and they just had enough. Size of the fund, you wanna know they have what we call dry powder. That's extra cash for those additional rounds. When you do your, if you do your series B, if the A investors don't invest in your B, um, that sends a negative signal to the market sometimes. You know, unless you can explain that, there's a good reason. But you'd rather have a deal where the A investors have enough confidence of putting money into the B. Fund two, fund three, that's great. That means they're gonna be around for a long time, even when that fund uh, that fund ends. And then the last thing I'll say is find out if they're litigious. You know, don't do business with litigious people. That's my rule of thumb, right? Everybody has litigation at some point in their careers. You know, I'm not saying that's a deal breaker, but how much litigation is, right? 
If you see somebody that is using the court system, especially here in California, where it is subject to abuse, uh, in order to bludgeon founders and entrepreneurs, you don't want to do business with them. Um, and that, by the way, that's true of anyone you do business with, by the way. Uh, de just deal with ethical people. All right, I want to turn my attention to a couple of the questions here now. Um, does it make sense to offer intellectual property of the firm as security? So, um, yeah, that's the only security that you have a lot of times is your IP uh, if you're in a technology startup. And there's a whole industry around that that takes IP as security. It's called venture debt, right? They will lend to the company. Um, it's generally expensive, right? I don't, I'm not, it may be right for you, it might not, but just understand that venture debt is expensive. They'll lend you money, they'll take security. You know what we mean by that? They take a lien in your intellectual property. So if you don't pay the debt, you basically, they can foreclose on the IP and take it away from you. And they also usually take some sort of equity kicker, usually in the form of warrants. A warrant is a right to purchase stock in your company. So they've got an equity upside in your company. So that's what makes it so expensive. But sometimes for a little bit more mature company that has patents and has some uh, leanable, we'll call it, intellectual property, could be a good way to go. By the way, on that point, um, we don't see that many convertible promissory notes anymore. These days, we usually see what they call safes. So convertible promissory note, the idea is the angel says, here, I'm going to loan you money, and you can either repay me or... I can convert this note into stock when you do your next round. Uh, however, if you don't do either, if you don't have a next round within a year, year and a half, whenever it is, when the note comes due, then I can call the note and you have to repay me. And if you don't, I can sue you. And I still see a few secured convertible notes out there. And I've seen founders lose their companies to that because then they get sued. I've seen that more than once. Uh, I've seen that in large, relatively large companies. Um, then they sue and they take all of the all of the uh, company's assets. And in fact, sometimes they convert, they get a preference on the debt, believe it or not. So I loan you four million, but I get ten million dollars back. Um, I've seen those deals, or I get your whole company. Um, so be super careful about anything that that looks like debt or looks like security, uh, because let's be honest, things always take longer than you think. You're not going to get that next round in a year. That note's going to go into default. They always do. And you want investors that are not going to take advantage of you. Uh, you want investors that are going to let the note ride until you do get the next round and you can convert the note. Safes, you don't have that problem. That's a simple agreement for future equity. There is no uh, call date or maturity date on a safe. It just converts into stock uh, on various different scenarios, usually a, a next funding. All right, let's go on to the next question here. Government funding for uh, startups to leverage technology and analytics. Yeah, keep in mind on the government funding, you know, it's gotta be something that um, will, uh, there's plenty of information online about SBIR and STTR. And it's gotta be something that aids federal research and development. So it can be all the things that you say, but you might have a better chance. For example, if you're doing energy tech right now, that's a good place to be. There's a lot of money around energy tech. If you're doing biotech right now, there's money around biotech and health tech, things like that. Um, so uh, check the resources online. I'm generally, like I say, I've not been a big fan of government funding because it is so distraction, so distracting to do all the work it takes to actually get the money. I think if you put that kind of effort into raising money from investors, you might do better off. Um, somebody wants to know how this might impact a future investor's valuation. Um, I'm not sure which slides you're referring to, but let's talk about valuation. Um, so, uh, like I say, valuation is really usually just a function of math. And, and the, the VCs, by the way, um, I, I represent both, I'm on both sides, emerging growth and venture capital. And I can tell you that they're looking, they're doing numbers, they're doing numbers, and you need to do numbers if you're going to play this game um, and do pro formas and what ifs and what happens. And the two kinds of numbers and pro formas and what ifs you'll do is one is control and one is economics. On the control side, 
It's, gee, if I give up two board seats now, you know, how is that going to impact what happens down the road? Or if I give these protective provisions, in other words, if I give the venture capitalist the right to approve or veto these actions, how is that going to affect what I can do and how much leverage they have? Those are control sort of uh, projections. The other kind are the economic, where we say, okay, if the, if the investor has these sorts of rights, economic rights in my company, because preferred stock has preferences, right? That's why they call it preferred stock. So it has special rights to priority distributions unless it converts to common. Um, how is that going to play out on various exit scenarios? If I sell for 50 million, who's gonna get what? If I sell for 100 million, who's gonna get what? If I sell for 150 million, who's gonna get what? And by the way, it has to be at least those kind of numbers or VCs aren't interested. In fact, even at those numbers, they're probably not interested. Uh, they wanna know you, you have the potential of getting a lot bigger than that. So, um, so the question was, how, how does your early planning affect your valuation? Well, on one hand, not much, uh, because keep in mind, you're, well, we went through a lot of slides. Let me back to the front. Not much because we um, have plenty of opportunities to adjust that. But one thing is for sure, if, if you have a, a high valuation early on, you can't assume that you're going to have that high valuation uh, down the road or that's going to help you at all in the next financing. It just won't. Um, it's a good starting point, but the next round of investors, they're going to go through and, and do their own diligence and come to their own conclusions. And that very well may be a down round because they don't care. They don't care if you do a down round unless they're participating in the early rounds. And even if they are, they might not care because, you know, they're, they're going to be able to make it up on the, on the next round that's down. In other words, at a lower valuation. So you want to, you know, you want to try to get your valuation right, but it's not fatal uh, if you don't, because it's going to be readjusted uh, every time, every every time you go out for money. Okay, hold on here. Did I have any other questions? Uh, curious, the percentage of these angels in your experience. By these angels, I think you mean bad angels. Not many, not many, especially here in Silicon Valley. This is a small community. Everybody knows everybody else. When people start playing games like that, I'm not going to mention names, but they start playing games. They're going to be all over the internet immediately. People are going to talk about them on Reddit. They're going to say, I'll never work with this guy again. Um, if you want a, an example of that, go Google um, Ryan Caldwell and Circle Up. He was the CEO of Circle Up, um, who put a letter on Medium, I think, or Google Docs. And made it public a letter to his venture capital uh, director um, and um, they did not have a good relationship let me put it that way so most angels will you know but you do get you do get the bad ones you know maybe one in ten i worry about uh, so you know there are bad actors out there just keep that in mind and you can't assume that they're all good you can't assume the world is full of good people you have to assume that uh, human nature is fundamentally bad until they prove otherwise <laughs>